lot of those things have gotten you some different help and healing with the kiddos. But chances are it hasn't gotten you all the answers that you're looking for, because otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm going to give you this one missing link that you guys haven't heard about, you haven't seen, you haven't read about. And knowledge is power, <coughs> but there's more to that, right? I'm going to give you, again, a lot of science, a lot of background on how this all comes about. At the end, I'm going to give you some action steps. It's the implementation and action upon that knowledge that's going to get you the results that you're wanting for your kids, for your family. So I'm going to show you guys a quick video, and we're going to test your guys' awareness. So what this is, is it's a video of two teams, one team all dressed in white, one team all dressed in black. So I want you guys to watch the team dressed in white, and you're going to count how many times they pass this basketball. At the end of it, I'm going to stop it. And we're going to see how good you guys are at this awareness test. What are you guys saying? 14, 13, 13, 13, 13, I had 12. I had 14. 12, 13, 14, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually 13, oh. but who saw the moonwalking bear? What? Oh. <laughs> Did any of you guys see the moonwalking bear. bear in there? No. I'm not at all. I know. hard to find. Because he's in he's black. Right, so he's, here. he's all black. No, there he is. Ah! In the <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so this the is line. the root and the core of the conversation that this is going to be set around mm -hmm. tonight. It's easy to miss things that you're not looking for. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And right at the beginning of life, there's something that's happening to 80 to 90 percent of these kiddos that's happening right in front of our eyes, right in front of medical professionals' eyes. And we're missing it because we're not trained to look for it. And so that's what this is gonna be tailored around tonight. So what is this perfect storm and where did it come from? In chiropractic school, we always talked about DC standing for doctor of cause and not just doctor of chiropractic because it's our job to find the root causes of issues and not just treat symptoms or not just treat the effect, not treat the output. We want to find the root cause of problems because if you know the cause, then you know how to fix the cause. And so that's what we are trained to do. So with anyone, but especially with these kiddos, what happens is, generically speaking, when you go to a doctor's office, what happens? You fill out some paperwork, the doctor comes in for a couple minutes usually, right? They say you have this diagnosis. They say this is what you gotta do, this is what you gotta take, and they send you on your way. And it's usually a couple minutes, right? It's not a long conversation with that doctor. That's where we're a lot different. So with anyone, but especially with these kiddos, I'm gonna take you, the mom, into the office and I'm gonna sit down with you. My, one of my mentors <coughs> back a couple years ago now, he told me, that the number one way to get to the root cause of problems is yes, we have to know the science, yes, we have to know the neurology, yes, we have to know the physiology of things, we have to know that stuff in and out. But he said the number one way to find the cause, especially for these kiddos that have these challenges, is to shut up and listen to the mom. And that's what I've done. I, I bring the moms into that room, we sit down, and I listen to you guys. And I've been listening to you guys, for, to all these moms, and I ask questions starting from pregnancy, 
starting from before the child was born to know how they've gotten to the point of where they're at. And so what we have found, not just me, but all these other chiropractors that are trained to work with these kids, what we found is that every single one of these have a very, very, very similar case history. And it starts in pregnancy. And that leads to these issues. And so there's five factors, five factors to this perfect storm that we found that have been very similar for all these kids that are diagnosed with these challenges. The first one, and just to be clear on this, these are pretty generic, so there's like 50 subcategories of each of these. So just because your kiddo doesn't necessarily have one or all of these, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a subcategory that's causing, if it happened at the early stage of brain development, that caused some of these issues to start to occur. So what are these steps to that perfect storm? The first thing that we find is that during pregnancy, there was some major stress that happened. Whether it was something abnormal was shown up on the ultrasound, which led to more ultrasounds, which led to increased stress, which led to increased blood pressure, which led to increased maybe bed, maybe bed rest, which led to increased interventions. Maybe there was a move. Maybe you moved houses. Maybe you moved states. Maybe you moved away from home. Maybe you had a miscarriage before, and you're worried and stressed that that could happen again or you had trouble getting pregnant before, and you're worried that you might lose the baby. There was some type of stress that happened during pregnancy with a lot of these moms that have these kiddos with these issues. That's the first step. And so when a mom is stressed during pregnancy, the baby's wiring is the mom's wiring. So the baby senses that. The baby gets stressed as well. And what research is now showing is that the more stressed that there, the more stress that there is during pregnancy, the more stress that is gonna be on these kids' nervous systems later on in life. And so that, that kind of is a ripple effect. So then what happens after pregnancy is if there is an increase in stress during pregnancy, that leads to more interventions during the labor delivery birth process, right? What are some of those labor delivery interventions that happen? This is the second element. And this is what happens 80 to 90% of the time with these kiddos. And it's happening right in front of our eyes and we're missing it because we're not trained to look for it, but we're missing the science behind what it is doing to their nervous system. The second thing is the intervention injury at birth. So any type of intervention at birth, whether that's C-section, forceps, vacuum birth, quarter after on the neck, induction, any type of intervention that happens at birth puts a tremendous amount of stress and tension on the upper part of the neck. That is another stress that is increased during these kids that keeps building up and adding up. And so what happens is, what happens after, after this stage, what do we then find? after the labor and delivery if, it's, if they have some type of intervention. Then we see that a lot of these kiddos, they have trouble latching, they have trouble nursing, they have trouble digesting, they have trouble sleeping, they're fussy, they have reflux, <coughs> they have digestion. They, they have all these different things that start showing up as a baby, right? What do we call that? when they're a baby and they have these different things. What's that called? Colic, <laughs> right? A lot of babies are colicky. They're fussy. They don't, they, they have that reflux. They have trouble latching. They have all these different issues. What are babies supposed to do? Babies are supposed to eat, sleep, and poop, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of these babies, they're crying a lot. They're not sleeping well. They're not digesting like they should. And it all comes from increased stress that builds up and builds up and keeps coming. So then after that, then they keep growing and they keep having all these different issues. That turns into sicknesses and ear infections and strep throat and all these different things that build up over time. 
one of the biggest issues I think with our pediatric healthcare system right now is that we're being told that a lot of these things are normal. That it's normal that these some kids have it. It's kind of a phase. They'll grow out of it, right? These things, they're not normal. It's not normal for a baby not to go to the bathroom regularly. It's not right normal for them to be spitting up and throwing up as much as they are. It's not normal for them not to be sleeping most of the day. These things aren't normal. They're common, but they're not normal. It's not normal for a kid to get, a baby to get four ear infections by the time they're a year old. That's, but it's happening a lot. And all this stuff, it, it just kind of adds up and it builds up. And it's starting from early on, the early stages. Another thing is we're told, we're told that they'll grow out of it. Like I said, they'll, they'll get over it. It's, it's a phase. And you guys, a baby's brain and nervous system develops more in a day than ours does an entire year of life. Their nervous system and brain is developing so rapidly in those first few stages of life, or first few years of life, that if we just kind of say it's a phase and we give them amoxicillin or we give them Prilosec, and we see, let's see how it goes, and they'll grow out of it, that's kind of how we get to where we're at now. Because it's that short window of opportunity where all the brain development, all the, all the nervous system development occurs. That's why it turns into the motor delays, the speech delays, the, all these other issues, the emotional challenges. It kind of all adds up with time. What we find is that a colic stressed out a stressed out baby turns into a stressed out, stimming, hyperactive kiddo later on in life. That's what we're seeing with a lot of these kiddos. So that's that last piece. That's the story, quick story of the perfect storm. Those five things. So to give you another quick graphic of this, we have this gas for spray pedal analogy, and this is on those folders that you guys have. So there's three T's that happen <clears throat> with this. Trauma, toxins, thoughts. The more that these kids have these three things, the earlier on in life, the more challenges that they're probably gonna have later on in life. And so, again, the first one, three, five, seven years of life, the, that's when the brain is the most plastic, meaning that it changes the most, meaning that whatever experiences happen during those first few years of life sets them up for how their brain is hardwired later on in life. And so stress begets stress. So again, if it's a stressed out brain and nervous system early on in life, it's gonna turn into stress and other issues down the road. So one of these, things, the top one, toxins, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about all the crap that's in our food, our environment, all the toxins out there. Maybe you've read about like the gluten-free, casein-free, dairy-free, red dyes, glycophosphate, all this different type of stuff. Those are all toxic chemicals that are in our environment, in our food. And what do a lot of these kids, what does their diet consist of? A lot of it's mac and cheese, chicken nuggets, pizza, um, french fries, right? That's what, it, hot dogs. <coughs> it's not real natural food that our bodies know how to process. So that's a stress on the nervous system. So that is one side of it that we gotta start getting rid of. I mean, it's hard to change that because a lot of kids are picky, but that's part of it. I mean, it is part of it that our bodies are so stressed because of that because we don't know how to deal with and process those chemicals that are in our food. The next thing, um, toxins, that's part of it, but toxic, toxins have been around for a long time, so that's not the main part of this. That is a part that we do want to start, get rid of, but again, like I said, these toxic chemicals, these toxins in our environment, they've been around for a long time. It's the other two stressors that have really gone through the roof in the last generation or two. And those are The other one is thought, thoughts and traumas. So again, what happens with that second element 
of that perfect storm with the injury or intervention at birth. That causes these kids to get stuck in a sympathetic system. Sympathetic is fight or flight, means stress stuck on. So when you're in a sympathetic system, that we absolutely need this system to be there for situations like if you were driving in a car and a deer ran out in front of you. You want that sympathetic system to jump on right then to, uh, to protect you. It tells you, you gotta hit the brakes, you gotta let the deer pass, otherwise you're gonna get in an accident, you're gonna get hurt. So we need that sympathetic system to be there. But as soon as that deer runs by, as soon as you hit the brakes, we need the parasympathetics to jump back on. The parasympathetics is growth and development. You can't be in sympathetic and parasympathetic at the same time. Sympathetic is protective mode, parasympathetic is growth and development. So these kids, they're stuck in this sympathetic state. That's why they're not growing and developing like they should, because they can't be in both at the same time. And so that's why these kids that have ADHD, sensory processing, all these different things, they're overstimulated, they're overreacting because that's all they know. That's the way that their brain is trained. That's the way that, the way that their brain is wired right now. <coughs> that's also why, real quick, that's also why kids that have these different challenges, they don't sleep well at night or they can't fall asleep at night. Or if they do, they wake up and they move from the bed to the couch to the chair. They don't get good quality sleep at night. So then what does that lead to? Trouble focusing trouble concentrating to get their homework done, right? They can't focus in school. And it's just one thing that kind of leads to the other. To stick with this car analogy real quick, these kids that are stuck on that five, 6,000 RPM and they only have about 1,000, 2,000 RPM gap room before they redline. Redlining for these kiddos is the challenges that come up. Does that all make sense so far? Getting there, yeah. <laughs> This next quote, this is Dr. Bruce Lipton. He is a psychologist. Um, I think this quote will bring it a little bit to get more together for you guys. So the function of the nervous system is to perceive the environment and coordinate the behavior of all other cells. Two of the main words in there are perception and coordination. <clears throat> a lot of, a lot, some of you might read this from right to left. You might think that your kiddo has some type of behavior problem that you need to calm down, you need to relax, you need to get rid of that behavior problem, balance it out. But the behavior is the output. The behavior is the effect. It's the symptom. And so maybe you've tried different reward systems of saying, hey, if you really focus and concentrate and get your homework done and do well in school and all these different things, then we'll go out for ice cream, or maybe you try the sticker charts, or maybe you've tried different reward systems to try and get these kiddos to do better and to stop with the behavior, right? But it probably hasn't worked. Or maybe you tried the opposite end. Maybe you tried disciplining them. Maybe you tried, you get frustrated and you start yelling and you, you just discipline them. And that doesn't work either. Because the behavior is the effect. And these are input, these are, perception and coordination neurological input problems that are creating the output problems. But it's our natural approach with everything that we treat the symptom or we treat the effect. Behavior is the effect, we can't treat the effect. We have to, we have to fix the input, the cause, and in return, the behavior is gonna get better. That'll calm them down. Okay, so subluxation is a chiropractic term. When you hear subluxation, it means stress stuck on the nervous system. The next 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna go through 4D neurological nerdy science terms. <laughs> um, they're pretty intense terms, but again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about them in a way that hopefully it's pretty understanding for you. So the first one, dyskinesia, this is going to tell you why you're listening to a pediatric chiropractor talk about these challenges. Maybe you got here thinking that chiropractic was just about stiff necks and sore backs, but dyskinesia is what's 
the main one that kicks all these things off. So I'm gonna get into this. I will go through these in more detail. Those are them real quick. So dyskinesia, kinetics is a study of movement and alignment. <coughs> dyskinesia is misalignment and fixation. So what happens during that second element of the perfect storm is the main cause of dyskinesia. And that's this next picture I'm gonna show you. It's gonna be kind of a right in your face picture, um, but it's probably gonna be the most powerful slide that a lot of you will see tonight, especially if you've had something like this happen with you. So, this is a picture of a C-section. And this isn't out of the norm. Like, this is very typical. If you Google C-section, this is what you're going to find. All kinds of pictures like this. This is what, this is the moonwalking bear. This is what is being missed. It's the root and cause of a lot of these challenges, a lot of these issues. Then this happens right at that beginning of the life. And what happens is they pull, whether it's C-section or it could be vacuum or anything, there's they're pulling, twisting, turning these babies' necks. And that is putting 60 to 90 pounds of pressure in that upper part of the neck. Why is this important? This area is where the brainstem is. Absolute most vital, most important part of your body. That amount of pressure is, can really cause that top bone to misalign, lock up. That's the dyskinesia. That's that first part of the perfect storm. Right up there is where the brain connects to the body. The body connects to the brain. 90% of the sensory stimulation is in that part of the neck. Again, leading to these sensory challenges. If you think about it, if, you, if I came up to someone and I just said, let me lift you, let me, let me pick up your kid and they pick him up by the neck, you would slap them silly. Like you would never think, just to pick up a baby, <coughs> just picking them up, that's nothing compared to this. And they're twisting and pulling, and we're missing what it's doing to that upper part of the neck and how it's affecting these child's brains and nervous system and the development of it. And this is what has drastically changed over the last generation or two, is how often these are taking place. And look how much more common these different challenges have come up in the last generation or two. This, I believe, is where it's all stemming. So, next thing, this is a quick study. This is a study done actually by osteopaths. Osteopaths are, they're in a way similar to us. Um, but they work with more bone and joint. They don't necessarily focus on the nervous system or neurology. So what they did was they took somatic dysfunction in this. That is the same thing basically as subluxation, which again is stress stuck on the nervous system. So somatic dysfunction, what they did was they took 100 healthy infants, and they were, this is right after like birth, so they were healthy infants. And what they did was they found 99 out of 100 of these infants had some pattern of somatic dysfunction at that early stage in life. What they also found was that the more intervention that there was at birth, the longer the labor and delivery times, the more severe the case of somatic dysfunction. And so again, that's subluxation in our term. So that goes right along. We're, there's more and more and more research that's showing that the more interventions early on in pregnancy and labor and delivery and all these different things are leading to more severe cases of these stressed out infants and kiddos later on in life. So again, we're, we're changing the way that we're bringing our kiddos into this world. And like I said, the C-section rates have increased dramatically over the last several years. That's the main thing, but it's not just C-sections. Like I said, just interventions in general have increased dramatically. Um, the nervous system is what controls every other system in our body. And so 
this is why a lot of these kiddos, they have these challenges, but they also tend to get sick more often. They tend to, again, like I said, they have motor delays, speech delays, emotional challenges. They have all these different things that are coming up. They get ear infections, they're colicky. They have all these, it's not just that they have these challenges. They have a lot of different things that are going on. And it's because if the nervous system is hacked early on in life, so is every other system in their body. And so you guys got here because it was ADHD and sensory processing, but what season is it now? What happens in April? Allergies. Allergy. Allergies. Allergies and sinus issues. So all these kiddos, they have a lot of allergy issues as well, and they start coming about. And again, the nervous system controls the immune system. So if the nervous system is stuck in that sympathetic state, to give you another example of this, when the nervous system is stuck in sympathetics, that's like if you're if a tiger is chasing after you, you're, or you're running from the tiger, you're not going to worry about digesting at that time. You're not going to worry. You're not going to worry about sleeping. You're not going to worry about someone coming up and sneezing on you and giving you some type of cold virus. The immune system shuts down. The digestive system shuts down. The again, your immune system, everything shuts down because you're stuck in that sympathetic state, and the parasympathetics don't work. And so the last, the last little bit of that is when this dyskinesia sets in, it becomes an input problem. And so when that top bone misaligns in that upper part of the neck and that causes that misalignment and that fixation, motion is everything. Motion is life for these kiddos. So I'm sure some of you probably are like tired of sitting down and you're like, Can I, if, what, if, what would happen if you just were able to get up and walk and move around? Your brain would calm down a little. It's so important for movement for these kiddos, and yet part of it is they're stuck in school all day, and then what happens when they get home? They're on their iPads, they're playing video games. How much movement, how much exercise, how much activity are they getting throughout the day? None, and motion is so important for the brain development. That type of motion, but also the motion of the bones and joints in the neck and spine as well. So. When that dyskinesia sets in, it causes disapparentation. Afer is incoming neurological proprioceptive input. Disapparentation means abnormal input to the brain. What it causes is it causes decreased um, proprioception. Proprioception is your body's way of perceiving where things are at in space. It tells me how my hands out here. It tells me my foot's moving. It's the way of perceiving things, but it decreases these signals to the brain whenever there's that misalignment in the upper part of the neck. That allows for the gate for nociception to open up. Nociception is noise. This is why kiddos who overreact, they have all this noise, this disconnection, this all this crap that's going into their brain that they can't calm down. They can't shut off. And so that's why they overreact to situations. That's why they overreact in certain environmental social settings because they perceive, the way that they're perceiving these things is a stress. They're perceiving it as a stress. And so that's how they're gonna react. They're gonna react in a stressful situation, <coughs> stressful way in that parasympathetic fight or, or sympathetic fight or flight state. And so 60%, the reason it's a chiropractic conversation, 60% of that proprioception comes from the spine. And a third of that actually comes from that upper part of the neck. So when they're not getting these proper signals that are going to the brain, that's decreasing the perception and it's increasing that noise. It's opening the gate for all that noise to come in. Their brains can't calm down, they can't relax, they can't shut it off. Okay, so to put this all together, Subluxation happens a lot from that second element of the perfect storm. Misalignment, fixation, the upper part of the neck, that's dyskinesia. Dyskinesia leads to disapparentation. Disapparentation is abnormal input to the brain. Decreased proprioception, increased nociception. Nociception is the noise. That leads to dysautonomia. Dysautonomia is what I've been talking about it all night. Dysautonomia is the nervous system stuck in sympathetic fight or flight 
mode. The more stuck, the more challenges, the more of those three T's that the kiddos had on early on in life, the more challenges that they're gonna have later on in life. And so, again, once, one more time, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. And again, parasympathetic is growth and development. Sympathetic is protective mode. So you can't get both of those at the same time. So if these kids are constantly stuck in that sympathetic system, they're not gonna grow and develop like they should. So, what do we do about it? How do we help it? It's kind of a dangerous world out there. All the things that you can Google and find on the internet, right? We can Google everything nowadays. If there was one thing that I wanted you guys to look and find everything that you could about, it would be dysautonomia in the vagus nerve. You guys, the vagus <coughs> nerve is the missing link for these kiddos. It's the brake pedal. It's the number one most potent parasympathetic nerve. The vagus nerve is what runs right up here between one to two centimeters between the joint of that skull and the top bone. Runs right down the foramen magnum into the cervical spine, down into the thoracic spine, controls the esophagus, controls stomach, digestive issues. That's why a lot of these kiddos they get the reflux because when the vagus nerve is shut down from that bone misaligning and putting pressure on that, shuts the vagus nerve off, shuts the parasympathetics off, closes down the esophagus, they get the reflux. Shuts down the digestive system. They can't go to the bathroom like they should. They don't sleep like they should. The vagus nerve has nerves that go to the heart and lungs, which is what allows them to calm and relax. This is also why we see the vagus nerve, when that's shut down, these kids' heart rates are through the roof. They're it's way higher than what they should be. 80 to 90% of the stimulation is the sensory receptors in that upper part of the neck. The vagus nerve controls 80 to 90% of that. The vagus nerve has, it's, a, called a, it's called the wandering nerve. There's this thing called the polyvagal theory that is more recent, more new, that has more information talking about how the vagus nerve actually controls social and emotional development as well. The vagus nerve, it has sensors that, sensory nerves that go to the eyes, which tells us if you're a friend or a foe. And again, if all these kiddos know is that they see this as a stress response, that's how they're gonna react in social, social, social situations. They're gonna see it as a stress. And so we got to, we know this. So our job is to turn back on the brake pedal, to turn on the brake pedal, to turn on, re-stimulate, reactivate this vagus nerve. That's the cause, that's the missing link that everyone is missing. And it's, again, it's, it's all from this upper part of the neck, just that slight misalignment with these infants, with these kids. Hmm. This is why all these kids, they, <coughs> every situation they react to, they perceive, they, react to, they can't handle all the noisy situations, they can't handle transitions, they can't handle every stitch, every tag they feel because it's overstimulatory, it's overreacting to every little thing. But they can't control that. They literally can't control it because it's an input problem. It's this neurological input changes that are happening to their brain and to their nervous system. And that's what the last D is. The last D is dyspinesis. Dyspinesis is the abnormal energy output. That is the behavior. Again, the behavior is the effect. The behavior is not the cause. So we gotta treat the cause to fix the effect. The behavior will get better when we can balance out the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic system. Okay, so the last study here, I'm we're almost finished up. This last study, this was a study done by PTs, OTs, speech therapists, a lot of different of those groups of people. And those are so, vitally important in the role of some of these kiddos as well, but it's never gonna fix the full cause of the problem either. They're, what they do is absolutely important, it's vital, but it's not gonna necessarily truly correct the whole situation either. But what they did, this was a very, this goes right along with what I was just talking about. What they did was they took three different groups of kids. They took kids that have no sensory issues, kids that have mild sensory issues, and kids that have severe sensory issues. And what they did was they, t they measured their resting parasympathetic vagal tone. And the kids that had severe sensory issues, 
the bagel, there was no bagel tone. It was shut off completely. The kids that had normal or no sensory issues, did I say that right? The kids that have no sensory issues, their bagel tone was normal. The parasympathetic bagel tone was normal, which why they had no sensory problems. But the ones that had the severe sensory issues, their bagel tone was pretty much non-existent. So then they took the same three groups of kids and they gave them some type of sensory challenge, whether it was auditory, visual, physical, they gave them some type of sensory challenge and they found the same thing. They measured the resting heart rate. And all these kiddos, the variability of those did not, the, it was the lowest vagal tone. They did not respond to those activities at all. The vagus nerve was shut down. That's the, that's the whole story behind this. These kids that have these challenges, the vagus nerve, the parasympathetics, shut off. Don't work at all. Sympathetic system is on gas pedal, Ferrari, go, 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 can't slow down, can't calm down, relax. That's, that's the, whole, the whole story behind it. So there are three different types of these kiddos. This just kind of puts them more into a term or a group because there, there are different types. So the first one, we term the raging bull. <laughs> this, these are the kids who are literally constant go, go, go. They get in trouble a lot. They get in trouble at school. And again, it's just their, their brains are stuck on Ferrari gas pedals and they literally have like bicycle brake pedals. That's basically what it is. But you guys, these kids, they're intelligent. They're extremely creative. They're very bright individuals, but they just can't control things. And so again, they just don't have that break. The, nervous, the parasympathetic vagus nerve is shut down. Then you have the drunken bull kids. These are more the coordination, the lack of coordination kids, the balance coordination, the, they have trouble, more trouble with focus and concentration. They're not necessarily the full blown kind of go, go, go. They still are, but to a less degree. And then most of the kids have a combination of both, the raging drunken bulls. And that's all of them together combined. So that's a good majority, probably 80% of the kids have a little bit of a combination of both of these. Okay, so for the answers now. We have to find ways to measure this, to quantify it, and to show the improvements, right? So the first thing that we do is we do these thermal scans. These are basically sensory scans. And so this allows us to see the perception, the coordination, the neurological conduit of these kids' nervous systems. So we run this scanner, it's a heat graph from their low back all the way up to the top of the neck. The red is basically these kids, they're sitting in front row concert to a Metallica concert, front row seat to a Metallica concert. That's their, the level of noise that these kids, the brains have. So we, with a lot of these kids, we see that very, I mean, that's, that's usually right on there with most every one of these kids, is they're gonna have some degree of this. And that tells us, again, that tells us the amount of stress. So it tells us the severity of it, the degree of it, and it measures kind of what state they're in. So it allows us to know how much care they're gonna need or how long it's gonna take. The second thing that we do is we're actually the only office right now in Central Ohio that has this, but we actually, depending on the age of the kiddo. So this is motion x-ray, it's video fluoroscopy, but it allows me to see exactly how the spine's moving. So it measures the dyskinetic part of that storm, perfect storm. So this is pinpoint, but again, I'm not gonna do this on infants, young kids. It's, it's more five, six, seven year olds. This is a 10th of the radiation of one single x-ray. So it's very, very minimal radiation, but the amount of information <coughs> that I can get from it tremendously outweighs the, the risks of any of it. So this is, to give you a quick view of what this looks like, this is a neck from the side, and then bringing their head down into flexion like this, and then coming back up, and they'll bring it all the way back. But this allows me to see exactly how those bones are moving, and if they're locked up with that dyskinesia state, or not, or if they're moving properly. So it pinpoints so that there's no guesswork involved with where the issues are stemming from. It's very clear for me to see. And then we also, again, depending on the age of the kiddo, we will take a set of x-rays. Usually just one on older infants, not infants, we never take x-rays on infants at all. 
but older kids, like seven, eight years old, will take at least one hip x-ray because kids fall on average 2,500 times by the time they're seven years old. So it's easy to knock things out. So this was actually a little, this was a, I think she was 11, 11 year old girl. Main thing was bedwetting, but she also had ADHD. She had behavior issues in the classroom and um, a couple different things going on. But 11 years old, couldn't do it in any stay over sleepovers at night. She was so, just, it's so hard for them because they, they can't live a normal life when they have all these different things going on. One of, the, one of the other things that I remember her mom very distinctly saying was that this girl, she would always overreact, over, always act out. The behavior was a big thing. So she was telling me, this was like three weeks after her first adjustment, she was telling me how there was this party over the weekend for a bunch of their friends. They were gonna go bowling and something came up. She couldn't go, the family couldn't go to it. And she said, normally this kid she would have kicked and screamed and yelled for hours and just been so upset and so frustrated and so, again, that just acting out behavior all night long. She said, she told her, she told her why. She kind of explained things a little bit more. She said for a little bit she had an issue, but she was nowhere near. She stopped within five minutes and that was it. And her mom was just like, like, she's like, that is, completely different than she's ever been in the past. And so that calmed down, her behavior helped. She Now again, she responded quickly, pretty quickly to that. Not all kids respond that quickly. If their nervous system and their brain's been wired like this for years, it, it does take time. It's not a it's not a right away thing. I mean, it does take time to rewire, excuse me, rewire that brain. Um, but her bedding, her bed wetting was gone after like the second visit. And again, that was, it just completely, the nerves that come out of that low back, these are the hips They come, that come out there, they go to the digestive, the reproductive organs. So because everything was really shifted in there, that's going to affect the nerves, the way that the brain can communicate with the bladder. So that blood wetting is a big one that a lot of kids we see tremendously improves after getting adjusted. So just a couple more action steps. You gotta, you gotta keep doing what you're doing tonight. You gotta always ask questions. You gotta find answers. And you're all moms in here. Well, not all, are you all moms? You're all moms, yeah. Are you a mom? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so everyone's a mom. Um, so you guys have a gut instinct that is stronger than so many different things. I mean, it knows more than anything. You have to trust your gut instinct. So if you're, <coughs> going to a doctor and they don't like you asking questions or they don't give you a lot of information and you don't like that and you want more information, you gotta, you gotta find someone who you do trust and who you do believe in and who's gonna give you the answers and who's gonna dive into the information and help your kiddo. You gotta, you gotta work on reducing those three T's that I was talking about, the toxins, thoughts, trauma. Those are, those are a big part of this. And so work on reducing those three things. Getting your child checked, for the subluxation. You guys, these kids, when their nervous system is stuck in this state, they can't live life to their full potential. They can't live life how they're supposed to and as good of a life as what they should. And so, again, I, I just personally love seeing that potential open up with a lot of these kids that they wouldn't necessarily have the chance for it to happen if they didn't get their nervous system checked. And so, I hope that I did give you guys some hope tonight, some different answers that you haven't heard, you haven't seen, you haven't read about. Um, and I'm just, I am grateful that you guys all did come out and listen. And if you guys have any questions, I would like to open that up for you. One thing I am, will offer is anyone who's interested, normally the full exam is 200 for everything. The thermal scan, the x-rays, the motion. We also test HRV. I just got this um, thing that allows us to test HRV for kids and we I'll look at it before and after adjustments and it's amazing to see the amount of response that these kids have before and after an adjustment with that as well. So normally that's 200. If you guys are interested, you're, I'm doing it for 125 tonight if you do sign up. So first that 200. So that's open for anyone and everyone. If you guys have people that aren't here that you know that want that and you want to sign up, great. Um, if not, if you guys have any questions at this point, I'd be happy to answer.
Okay, so once you do this and you find out all the information, then you make a plan with you. Mm -hmm. Like, here's what we're going to do. You're going to come yeah. once a week and just we're going to do what? Right, so. What do we do? What do I they do? do? Like, yeah. once you make the plan, what's like a typical, like, what it like? So once a week for a year, three months? I mean, I don't know. I mean, for kids, kids, but just. Right, it general. is. It, generally speaking, for kids, <coughs> I do this more on a three to six month basis. Because I want to see how there is every kid responds differently, every kid reacts differently. So I base it off what I find with the exam results first. Okay. Then I set up a plan. Depending on the severity of how things, the history, I take the whole history into play, I take all that. And based on what we found with previous kids that have similar attributes, similar challenges, or in certain groups, I take that and then I give the plan. But with kids, I do. I usually start with a three to six month plan mm -hmm. based on the severity. And like usually, so starting out, usually it's twice a week for these mm -hmm. kiddos. For usually it's two months or so at that, and then I drop it down and I drop it down kind of as mm -hmm. time goes on. But and what do you do? What do they do? So what they do do? adjustments. Yeah. So for infants, the younger kids, all it is is a light pressure, very light pressures like this, mm -hmm. with. A little bit older kids, five, six, seven, they'll still get, it's very light. I do no twisting, no cracking. It's it's still a hand adjustment, but I might use, like I said, on six, seven years old, I might do a light drop on these tables that are, I have over here where the piece of the table drops. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's literally, I put my thumb where it needs to be and I just drop kind of like that. It's very light. I, all the kiddos are like, <laughs> some of them are nervous at first and yeah. they're a little scared, but they're like, that was it, that was all it was. So it doesn't hurt at all. The kiddos actually love it a lot of times. The first time it's a little scary, but they they honestly enjoy it. And there's some adjustments that it's literally just a light pressure up the spine and that's all it is. And it's literally just kind of working up and that works with that parasympathetic to get them to calm down. So it's nothing crazy, there's nothing, that's gonna hurt them. It's it's so gentle. It's very specific, um, and I would show. I'm I'm always gonna show you what it's like before I do anything. Right. So I would demonstrate and, ex and show that to you before I do anything. So. Do you do you work um, with insurance at all? So a lot of insurance, especially for kids with these type of issues, insurance doesn't cover a lot of this. Okay. Um, they don't see the benefit of it for kids. It's it's the way that our health system, healthcare system is. Um, it is newer um, for a lot of a lot of people in general. I mean, again, a lot of you probably have had no idea that chiropractic could benefit this, and so chiropractic or insurance more wants to deal with like accident cases, traumas, things like that. They don't. This is more of a preventative type care. And they don't necessarily cover that. So I do different self-pay plans that are more affordable. Um, kids are actually less than adults for sure. So it's I do try to make it as affordable as I can for those that the insurance doesn't cover. Would the first um, visit be with just like mom? So or? yeah, what I would definitely recommend is if. You can, if you do want to set up a time, that I just set up a time with you. Don't bring, don't even bring the kiddo in, where I can go through the whole history, get the whole history. Don't have to worry about the kiddo running around and kind of doing two things at once. So if we can, definitely set that up where it's just like <coughs> me and you, and then after, then we'll bring in, set up another time where I can do the exam with them, just to break it up a little bit so it's not all at once and it's not a big chunk of time. First, can split that up to get the point. Good question. Are they actually healed after a certain amount of time? So, like, will they just become normal and not? Again, I, I don't treat anything. I don't treat ADHD. I don't treat. I work to make sure the nervous system is in balance. I work with the sympathetic, parasympathetic, making sure that those are in balance. Once we get those in balance, we find that a lot of different things. Calm down, relax, stop, go away. But I don't treat them. So to give a good example, a lot of kids, yes, we see that a lot of things do tend to go away. So I, I have a kid now off the walls, was off the walls when he first started coming in. And 
literally the parents were so stressed. They're like, we don't even know what to do. We've tried everything. And he's been under care now for a month. And she, she said, you know, we're starting to definitely notice the changes in behavior. He's starting to calm down. He's starting to relax. Now, no, it's not fixed yet, but they're starting to notice those changes. He was not eating much before. He was eating very little. Um, they just couldn't get him to eat. And now he's eating a lot more. They're like, we can't believe how much he's been eating in the last few weeks. He's like, this is so out of the norm. So it's things like that that will start to change. Again, that you don't even necessarily think would would start to change, but they do when that nervous system can get in balance. And well, so it's sort of like a starting point. Like, if you do this and things change, great. But if there's still some of those issues, then you know that there might be something else. There might be something else, be something yeah, else that you need to address. It's and that's like, why, yeah, I have to have check this. Right. This would be a good idea to do just to, to just get to check. Yeah. Because it could just be some, right. This. Right. Yep. And it could, you know, and that's that could thing. help it, but then there's still other things right. that wouldn't be helped with this or something. Maybe. That's why I do different plans because I can usually tell after a certain time if this is the core of it. Okay. Some kids, there are some kids that diet is a big part of it, right. a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. So like this will help to a certain extent, but if their diet is like crap and their body's responding to that and it can't, I yeah. mean, that's the main issue, then we know that, but that's why I do the different plans and I see how they respond over time to know what is, what is the problem first. Yeah, because again, like I said, different PT, OT, speech, all that stuff is great. I mean, that's all a part of it, but there's some things that can't, can only get help with so much because there's more to it than just one thing usually, so. How long are the appointments usually? Like Very quick. The okay. initial, the initial takes a little bit longer. Like that's when I'm going through stuff with you. That's 30, 45 minutes. The exam, 30-ish minutes. But every other visit, it's like five, 10 minutes. Okay. Very quick. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you want to work with um, like my kids have OTs and ABA and yeah. speech therapists and. So um, I've been connecting with several different in the community. I'm trying to find as many as I can to have different options for parents that, and when I, again, after I see maybe they need that, then I will say, hey, here's some options for you that I would go recommend checking those out. Especially if they have, um, like we do ABA, so it's like all behavior. Right. Uh, yeah, just if you're open to working um, yeah. with them, because they have insights that are- Absolutely. Absolutely. That's super useful. I just met with one, um, she actually owns the Bridgeway Academy, I don't know if you guys have heard that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she's the owner of it, and I just met with her, and she's, we're going to be working together some just because they help all these kiddos too. Yeah. And she was so excited that I connected. <coughs> but because again, no one knows. No one knows this stuff. And so I'm trying to get it out there, I'm trying to get people to understand. It's something, something new. Yeah. I like all the questions, these are all good. <laughs> I think you should get in the schools. I would like to. I'm trying. <laughs> it would just so, uh, it it offers a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah. I think. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting when you think about it. It's just it, it's mm -hmm. a different way of looking at yes. it. Yes. You know. Exactly. And, it might, and it's that, not all feels. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not. Right? It's, it's just not. interesting when you say it. Like, yeah. Right. You know, but mm -hmm. but we're not trained to look at it this way. Right. Like even though it's right there, it happens right there. It's, yeah, it's really not. Interesting. And you Google, and it's just a different path. Yeah, totally different. Path. And that's something I I think it's a good find that like it's not a starting point because we've all started. Yeah. Like a yeah, it's just figure something. that. That's like your main. It is. It's it is the main thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know your quote up there. With Geez, everybody always talks about training a whole child anyways. Right. Um, yeah. That would be a good insight to yeah. mm -hmm. have to evolve. Yeah. So, good job. Thank you. Very good.